Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Lam. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for coming in this morning and uh, do our talk and uh, video today. Uh, just before we start, uh, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement. Um, uh, well, Canton Sardine is situated in the unceded traditional uh, territory of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh two nations. And, um, and most of the nation is actually, yeah, you can see it from uh, Jeff's photograph and light boxes here in this show. And uh, I just want to also express my uh, absolute uh, honor. It is an incredible honor for me to work with you on this project. And uh, thank you so much for your generosity and, and your trust and support. My pleasure. To our little Gary. I'm glad to do this show. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Jeff, I have a few questions here uh, for you uh, today. Um, and uh, the, so the first question I have is, uh, the show we mounted in this show here is, is all light boxes. Obviously, this is for uh, medium sized, uh, two large size light boxes. And they, um, they're all about, you know, all the areas around in Vancouver. Uh, but last 14 or 15 years, uh, you haven't really been making light boxes. You mostly focus on print. And, uh, uh, but you are really famous for the light boxes when you start out and this kind of a part of your signature. It's just, I was just wondering uh, what happened the last 15 years, why you stopped and kind of switching to print base, yeah. Um, well, I, I began doing them in the 70s uh, mm -hmm. under very specific circumstances. Mm -hmm. That is, that uh, in those days, um, c uh, options for making color prints were m more limited than they are right. today. Yeah. So when I began to want to work in color mm. at this sort of scale, I had to find a medium that suited me. Mm -hmm. And I was having difficulty with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, of course, in those days, one worked at, uh, at commercial labs for processing yeah. film. Yeah. Or, and, or making prints. Yeah. And I wasn't happy with the paper prints that I was trying out. This mm. would be about 1976. Right. And the um, man at the lab suggested I have a try on these transparency material, which they mm. were using for advertising, of course. Right, right. And I hadn't thought about it. And then um, when I looked at a test or two that we'd made, I mm. realized that they were quite interesting and mm. new mm. because very few people had used that medium for anything serious in photography. They were exactly. just used for advertising. That's right, that's right. So I liked it and I thought, well, I'll experiment with it because it was sort of exciting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I did so and I made a couple of my first things like the destroyed room in, um, in that medium. Mm -hmm, and, it, mm -hmm. and it seemed to have a lot of potential. Right. So I just, in a way, fell into it. Oh, nice. And then I had to, um, you know, develop my photography to account for that medium because right. it, it imposed certain conditions of how you take pictures that were mm -hmm. specific. Yeah. And so I just drifted into it and stayed in it for 20 years because there was a lot of things to explore. Mm. And also because the reaction to the pictures I'd made was quite positive at the beginning and people were sort of intri yeah. intrigued by it yeah, of course. because they hadn't seen much of it. Yeah, yeah. And so it became a kind of a 20 or so year um, enterprise. Mm. But all the time I was, uh, all during that time I was interested in other things mm -hmm. because I didn't want to just have one, one thing to do. Mm -hmm. And slowly I got interested in black and white photography or at least I got more interested in black and white photography by the 90s. Yeah. And then I built a dark room which I still have and still use and started right. making black and white prints in the 90s. Yeah. And uh, that kind of led me in a different direction. Mm -hmm and sort of added something to my repertoire, of okay. what I could do, because yeah. now I could do black and white prints and, yeah. and color transparencies. Okay. But just at that time, then we began to see the inkjet printers emerge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then by around 2000, I was starting to work on uh, getting interested in inkjet printing because mm -hmm. I knew that that would, that would have a positive effect on my color, uh, on the possibility of color printing on yeah. paper. Yeah. Because one of the big problems of the older color photography was how difficult it was right, right. to deal with, uh, with color photo photographs on paper. Yeah. So by the time the inkjets began to emerge... Uh, Especially to see print, right? It's hard to control, yeah. Hard to control and they're yeah. not very permanent and all these yeah. things. Yeah. So by the time inkjets began to emerge yeah. in the early 2000s, I was 
getting into that. Okay. And so I just wanted to do something else. And then finally, yeah. when I began to make inkjet prints yeah. in, in, in color, yeah. I realized that I had these other options. Mm -hmm. And I'd done a lot of light boxes by that time, and I was sort of tired of, 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 of them, in a way, and tired of the, what I had to do to make them, because yeah. it, as I said, it imposed certain kinds of photography on me, yeah. certain kinds of technique that I really didn't want to do anymore. Yeah, yeah. So then I sort of slid over into making only opaque Mm. Uh, prints, yeah, which yeah. I've been doing, like you say, for 15 years or so. Yeah. Um, but I still have a machine that produces transparencies. Oh, great! Yeah. And I could turn back to doing them any time. Would you? I, haven't, would I, haven't, I might. I haven't okay. ruled it out because I don't think yeah. there's. An, I don't think there's any good reason to rule it out. Right. I have yeah. the capacity, and they still have, I think, a positive, interesting effect. I like the way these look. Yeah. I haven't really looked at, sort of my transparency work too much the last few years except yep. in exhibitions yep. um, and so I don't dislike them I just mm. moved on mm. but I haven't moved on absolutely and I could start tomorrow doing them again yeah we'd like to see more of them <laughs> we'll see yeah so in a way like you know like having a dark room and printing uh, press room and all that in in your studio that really give you much much more control to maneuver with different different ideas and different medium when it, when it comes to production right you have much more freedom I, when I first began like everybody in the 70s and 80s and even yeah. the 90s I had to work as I said in commercial labs mm -hmm. some of them are really good yeah. but they all have other priorities in making mm -hmm. the best prints they can make yeah. in, um, for, for an artist right, there's right. always there's always been a kind of a conflict yeah. between the lab and the, and the, and the artist mm -hmm. and very early on I you know, I struggled with that. Yeah, yeah. I, as soon as, and, and I always had the plan to try and get away from labs yeah. to create my own lab, basically. Oh, I see. And so yeah. it took me quite a while to do that, but I, you know, I mm. have done it. Yeah. And so now I'm, yeah, completely independent, and so I can make what I want. Yeah. You know, the commercial labs aren't ma aren't they aren't there to produce art. Mm. They're there to produce products. To serve clients. And, and they yeah. do that, and they do that work as well. But it was never a good match mm. between that enterprise and someone like me or any serious photographer because yeah. you know our criteria are different right for this shows here uh it's mainly about the genre of landscape documentary landscape or city uh, cityscape mm -hmm. uh it's pictures so um, i'm interested in about this idea of like making landscape pictures um like, like when it first appeared to you and you i realized you, you know you, a lot of your work is informed by uh, art history and maybe uh, picture making, uh, mm -hmm. genre, classical painting, um, compositions and all that. So I was wondering what uh, your first I idea of landscape making landscape picture uh, coming from and what kind of your, what your initial thought process around the genre yeah, and try to transfer into photography. When I first started to, when I first got the capacity to start making these kind of pictures in the 70s, yeah. That would have been, yeah, in the middle of the 70s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, for a lot of reasons, I was interested in finding ways to include aspects of uh, construction and artifice, shall we say, mm -hmm. in my work. And so when I made something like The Destroyed Room in 78, yep. that was a sort of a, a statement of what directions could be new at least for me in photography mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that involved the studio and yeah. inventing things conjuring them up mm -hmm. and so on and that dealt with techniques that you know previously were mostly used for commercial purposes mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. would like fashion and advertising would always use a studio and right. invent invent a situations yep. that would they could photograph right, right. Um, and it goes of course it goes back to the beginning of photography that mm -hmm. sort of studio artifice yeah but it hadn't been really, uh, it hadn't really evolved, in my opinion, mm. for a long time, and it hadn't been used seriously by an artist. Yeah. Um, so I was interested in that problem very elaborately for a long time. Mm. But at the same time, I mean, literally at the same time, mm. I was going around the city with my camera, yeah. trying to make pictures of the city. So mm. it was not something that came afterwards. It was a counterpart to this interest in the, in a way, the opposite, which was this 
you know, constructive, constructive pictorial view of what photography can be. At the same time, right. I was at the same time I was doing that. Yeah. I was trying to make cityscapes, and in fact, mm -hmm. the first ones I did, which we couldn't include in this show because I don't have them in Vancouver, mm -hmm. were done in 1980. Yep. So at almost exactly the same moment, when I was in my studio doing picture of a woman or destroyed room or something, yep. I was making cityscapes. I see. So they were almost like two. Uh, Direction? Two parallel directions yeah. at the same time. Okay. So, that, so what it meant to me was that um, objective photography, documentary photography, if you mm -hmm. want to call it that, yeah. was an equal, equally interesting the, uh, uh, to subjective photography or pictorial photography or studio photography. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. wanted to do them both and I wanted to do everything in between, whatever that was. Uh, see, so the okay. city was an immediate uh, subject and straight photography was an immediate interest. People mm -hmm. think that what I did was just, you know, invent something yeah. to do with construction and what I call cinematography, and it's yeah. true. But this was part of it. So I've been mm -hmm. doing them. I've been doing them since really 1980, yeah. and um, and that aspect of of photography is really interest. I think really important. First of all, we can't ever escape the general objective mm. documentary type of photography right. and I never tried to escape it mm. just add things to it I see. or at least go in different directions yeah so I you see. really started in 19, 1980 you, you say like, like the first one was the Steve's farm right at Steveston actually yeah. I was I was trying to find places in the 70s but didn't really succeed and hadn't hadn't really got it together okay. to get any pictures but I, okay. know, I made I think I made uh, those early pictures in the yeah in the early part of 1980 mm -hmm. and um, that sort of set off a whole train that's still going on right you know I'm trying to photograph uh, Vancouver again or at least I've been trying to do mm -hmm. these kind of pictures yeah. uh, regularly and I have but I haven't succeeded in completing one since the middle of the 90s somehow it's been a long time it's been a long time and yeah. a little frustrating and I and is I, it because the uh, you you're looking for location like a perfect Picture. I'm looking for something that has happened in the city that mm. reveals itself to me in a way that I feel I can make the kind of picture I want to make. Mm. Uh, and that's hard to explain exactly what that is, mm. but it's okay. the kind of picture that I feel will stand up on its own regardless of any interest, mm. any sociological interests, let's say, or urbanistic interest in the, in the okay. city. Yeah. And uh, you haven't been very successful, and I, I spend the time pretty yeah. regularly going yeah. around Vancouver and the suburbs trying to find something to do, okay. and it has escaped me for quite a while, <laughs> and I'm a little frustrated by that. Yeah, well, I, I, I wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> Anything I can help, let me know. Like, I will I let you know. Take you out. I, I do know a lot of great spots in North Vancouver and all that where I live. And I think it has possibly to do with the changes that are happening in the urban landscape now. Mm -hmm. And um, so, like, they're too complicated. Many, yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to ex sort of sum up what I think is happening, but okay. something about the urban landscape as it's evolving at the moment uh, isn't doing it for me. Mm -hmm. For example, if you look at, say, the old prison, yeah. it represents a time in Vancouver when development ha was uh, at a much earlier phase. Yes, yeah. And they're still in the 80s and the 90s, mm -hmm. these kind of uh, still unresolved spaces mm -hmm. where uh, development was just occurring, starting, yeah, starting, but yeah. had not really overwhelmed the landscape. Mm. So if you, you look at the river in the old prison, it's, it looks pretty much like it would have looked in 1940. That is true. Or 1920. Yeah. And you can even see the old penitentiary still standing there. That's right, that's right. Which had yeah. been there since probably the early part of the century. Yeah, yeah. The city hadn't filled itself in with newness yeah. as much as it has subsequently. That's going to be 30 years ago pretty soon. Right. And that's 25 years ago at least. Yeah. And, um, and so... That was a mo that was a moment in time yeah. that I think has sort of, to some degree, moved on, and there's and there's a, a new phase of development which is okay. maybe harder for me to see. It maybe that I it's there I'm just not seeing it because I'm too attached to, okay. you know, maybe a past moment. I hope yeah. not, but it could happen. It could right. be, it could be the case. I don't know. Yeah, 
Yeah, when I look at the old prison, I mean, uh, I, I keep sort of connecting this with sort of classical painter like uh, Claude Lorraine, an Italian classical um, landscape painter, you know, like what he's the 16th century, a lot of like pastoral landscape, uh, often have a bridge in the uh, sort of in the far, far away background, and then there'll be like a Roman castle on the side, and a, a few cows or ships in, in, on, on, along the river kind of thing. And, um, and the kind of scales are very different. Um, and also, um, for instance, like the coastal motifs also reminds me of Posse Sands, uh, uh, mountain view from Mountain um, St. Victoria, and the color palettes. So are you, were you informed by the history, the art history, like, the art history and the classical landscape painting, like when you were making these, or what, what's your what's your thoughts around it? Yeah. Well, I was informed by art history since I was a child because right. I was interested in it very early and yeah. um, looked at paintings and sculptures and drawings and so on from the age of ten or eleven. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Also, I was always drawing and painting myself. Yeah. So it kind of is part of my even childhood history. Yeah. yeah. And I, you know, I studied art history in school because it was easy for me, because mm. I already was familiar with it as a before I really even went to school or yeah, certainly went probably no, no, no more than the teacher. Maybe, yeah, but yeah. Uh, the point is, it was it just part of my background. Yeah. Uh, so it came kind of naturally in the mm. sense that mm. uh, it was just a childhood affection. Right. Right. And um, if you look at those. A sort of classicizing, stylized yeah. landscapes of Poussin or Claude Lorraine or whoever, yeah. you also realize that to, to some degree they had derived from their own observations. Mm. They abstracted from it and made it into a sort of um, series of conventional motifs like a castle, an overhanging tree, That's right. a river, yeah. a yeah. coastline, whatever it was, yeah. and formalized it. But it all came from their own observations. Mm -hmm. So. I don't think about those paintings uh, in any active way because mm. I'm not doing that. I'm also not painting, I'm photographing, which is a different procedure. Yeah. But picture making has its frame of reference. Yes. Picture making has its standards, yeah. its history, yeah. you know, and its, um, its criteria. Yeah. And I, don't, I, think those are in, I think that those are held in common by photographers Mm. Or painters, or draw, or drawers. Yeah. There's a lot of transition between, or a lot of discussion between those art forms, and there always, always, and there always has been since the beginning of photography. Mm. So when I make my pictures, I have that in mind. I have, uh, I have what, I have my idea of what makes a good picture, picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in mind, but I yeah. don't have in mind any particular good mm. picture, right. just what makes them. Okay. And so with photography, it becomes complex because. Uh, in painting, for example, if there's something that doesn't suit the composition yeah. or the aesthetic you, idea, you, you don't can have change to it. include it. Yeah. You can simply ignore it. Or you erase it sometimes. Yeah. Or you could paint it out. Yeah. Where in what this kind of work, yeah. uh, that's not really possible. So it's mm. quite easy for something to disturb the pictorial aim. Right. Some detail, some problem, some... Yeah. some circumstance of the real environment. Mm. Uh, I know how to include those things, uh, and I think photography does include those things, yeah. um, but it's a different process, mm. and so um, I can't really use any, in any direct way yeah. any lessons learned from painting. I can't use them directly mm. in what I do with a camera, because yeah. it's not the same art form. Right. It's yeah. not the same yeah. process. The process is different. Yeah, yeah so um, I think that anybody who's really interested in their own art form yeah. is probably, in some ways, pretty knowledgeable about, about what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. But there's just an infinite number of ways of using that. Yeah, yeah. And I use it in my way, and other people use it in some other way. Mm. But in terms of composition, though, um, you s somewhat have a little bit of controls by observation of, of, the, of the, the view and the picture frame and how you want the frame frame. Right. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Okay. One hopes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it shows actually because they all have very strong 
intention of composition it behind with the, I mean with photography it's essentially where you put the camera in yeah. relation to what you're looking at yeah. Yeah. and then uh, when you take the picture yeah. so you know quite a few of these and how you crop the picture right. Well, interesting enough, most of these pictures aren't cropped. They aren't cropped? Oh, wow. I mean, this is cropped because it's horizontal. Right, okay. But all that was cropped was, a, you know, a little bit of the sky and a little of the foreground. So, for, for instance, the coastal motif wasn't cropped at all? It was just acid? Pretty much the whole negative, same with that. Okay, um, okay. Because it wasn't necessary to crop unless you wanted to have a, a rectangle yeah. that is different in shape than the film. Right, right. So if you're using a certain kind of film, mm. you'll get a full image, right. say four by five inches, yeah, yeah. but if you want a, you know, a more horizontal picture, yeah. you're going to take something off. That's right, yeah. But I kind of like this almost four by five um, format, yeah. format yeah. and so there's very little cropping. So but that doesn't mean I wouldn't crop if I needed it. Yeah. So in a way, you just kind of, you, it, the framing is the most important with the viewfinder. With, yeah. I think okay. with any photograph, it's where the camera is. Yeah. First thing to Fair first enough. thing to know is wh whether the photographer put yeah. the camera in the right place. Yeah. And if he did, yeah. or she did, then it's likely to have better results. Also, mm. it's then when you're taking it, what the light is like, what time of day, what time of year, right. etc. And that's the other fundamental. That is true. And if you manage those two things, then yeah. that's what you're. That's that is the, the process. The essence, yeah. And like when you're taking this, let's say this four photograph. Uh, were you asking certain type of questions, like philosophically, maybe intellectually? Probably, yeah. but I don't know whether I could frame them in any particular way. Uh -huh. So, for example, in Park Drive, yeah. I had been, you know, like a lot of people, had gone through Stanley Park mm. and, and realized that over time, uh, parts of the forest, the forest cover, yeah. had vanished through storms, trees falling down, selective gardening, whatever, yeah. and yeah. I noticed that along this stretch of Park Drive, mm. on the, at least the one side, yeah. there's only a thin row of trees, right. and behind it there is no there are no real trees, that the forest has been, a lot of it's been removed, mm. and I thought that was sort of fascinating, that it was sort of like a hedge, uh, or a facade, yeah. that appeared to be a vestige of the original forest. You know, Stanley Park is supposed to be a remnant of what was old, here old forest, before yeah. we ever got here exactly, and so yeah. on or what was here for thousands of years, the that's primeval right. forest, but it's really not quite like that. And yeah. that seems sort of intriguing that this is really a, a, a rather meager stand of trees mm. that is all that's left over from, from, the, that side, yeah. from the past but yeah. also from the process of building the park, right. which of course is caused by the road going through it yeah. because it's really a, you know, there's a passageway that's running through it. And that just seemed like an interesting m element in the mm. city. Yeah. That standing at that point, because I went, I went back to the park, yeah. got out of my car, of course, yeah. and um, stood there and watched it and realized, yes, there's this density on one side and lesser density on the other side. Yeah. And it just kind of says something about uh, the whole pattern of the place. Mm. Well, I guess there's a lot of thoughts in that, but I don't know quite what they are. Um, I right. can't attach them to any particular, you know, philosophy, yeah. let's say, but it was an observation. Mm. It's interesting, you leave a couple of cards on the vantage point, that it's very tiny, it's almost invisible. Yeah, I like those cars, yeah. because it, it, they're coming at you. That is true. But you know what, what else is also reminds me, some of this like, early black and white French film and Italian films, always kind of driving in the car, in a fancy car on the trip. I hope it can, remi it can remind you of a lot of things. Yeah. Um, the, I thought that the instant of the photograph, the, that the moment I would take the photo, yeah. would be in a quiet interval between traffic. Uh, because you know, sometimes there's constant traffic going along that's and right. it's noisy and yeah. etc. Yeah, yeah. But um, somehow it seemed like this would be more interesting if the cars on Park Drive yeah. were just a, far enough away to sort of keep things at bay yeah. and give us a slight bubble of time okay. in which we could look at the park without any real uh, distraction from anyone else. So sort mm -hmm. of slightly solitary moment. It is. And, uh, and, I, uh, and of course I also wanted to compose it so that, um, and uh, this was yeah. partly luck, but also I mean I did walk a lot yeah. along Park Drive yeah. to see that the curve of the road and the curve of the sky up above the, 
between the trees, the two curves made one sort of beautiful curve. That is it. And that's just pure composition, just trying to make something that looks yeah, great, yeah, you know? Yeah. So that the, that. your head, your, you, it goes down like that, and then the, the lines on the road go back the opposite way in the curves. And, it yeah. was, and, and, the, and the opposite curves were really how I made the picture. Yeah, in terms of how you divided the pictorial space, it's very, very interesting. It's just about composing, and, that's, yeah. and that was possible simply by walking in and looking until I found the part of the, yeah. of the, of the road and the, and the forest that did something. I didn't plan to do it that way, it just, mm. I discovered it. That, at that point, and that was where one put the camera. Mm. And also I knew that I could not photograph it on a sunny day because the yeah. shadow patterns would d disturb that uh, fundamental element. Okay. So it had to be on a cloudy day. And so oh, it I was see, kind I of see. done in winter because, or late fall, I forget, yeah. um, because uh, the gray sky would not you know, create another element. Yeah, yeah. So all those kind of uh, issues that it becomes the way you make the picture. Yeah, because like when you, if you have a long shadow of those trees, then it, it becomes a very different pictures altogether. It would totally mess up the yeah. curve of the road, you That's see. Right. Then it would be covered, fractured with shadows, and yeah. that wouldn't, wouldn't work for this picture. Yeah. Some other picture, it would be fine, but not yeah. for this one. So, yeah. you know, I had to make, those are the kind of decisions I mm. have to try and make. Yeah. And so I, I discovered it at some point, and I didn't photograph it until I knew I could get the right kind of... Mm kind of daylight to make it. Do you have to like go back to visit the sites a yeah. few times yeah. just before you kind of put your cameras? Yeah. I think I, w I went there several times till I okay. realized what I was, I think okay. I probably have some uh, preliminary negs that were done in sunshine and I realized that wasn't going to work at all. Right. Okay. So I knew I had to you uh, know, wait for the, sometimes I wait for the season. Mm. Uh, when I made the coastal motifs, I think it was spring. Yeah. Early summer, late spring, yep. until by the fall. It's a little bit more blue skies in this picture. Yeah, yep. it's, I think that uh, it was made at that time of year, but I have a feeling that it, uh, it's a long time ago, yep. hard to remember, but I think that I discovered it and photographed it almost at the same time. Mm. So mm. once in a while, it would be, you know, fortunately I found the place at the time of year when I wanted it, yep. so I didn't have to wait several months to go back and okay. do it. Same with this one, I discovered it and photographed it. Uh, quite quickly within a few days. Uh, this is summertime. Okay, and in terms of coastal motif, like what what capture your imagination here? Like what what kind of attracted you to to frame this? Uh, well, the whole thing, obviously. I mean, yeah. I love the uh, I love the salt piles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Creating that kind of white. And this is an empty lot on a street whose name I can't remember. Up above boundary, as you can probably imagine, looking over the inlet. Yeah. And, um, and I, as I said, I, was, I often take some time and go and look around the city, see if I can find something. Mm -hmm. I go by car, I, I covered the whole lower mainland yeah. m many times. Yeah. Um, anyway, I found it uh, and it, it had in it just a lot of elements that seemed to add up. Mm. Maybe the most general one was the fact that the relation between the industry in yeah. forestry and fishing, whatever's going on there, yeah. uh, seemed to sit so gently in the landscape. It didn't seem like uh, some sort of an intrusion, mm. some sort of brutal intrusion of industry into the world. In a way, it's kind of extension of that, it has a balance of... And it seemed yeah, very harmonious, yes, and yeah. so it wasn't, I didn't think that was... I think that if I had, I wasn't, let's say, I wasn't looking for and I wasn't even unconsciously looking for, I don't think, mm -hmm. some sort of statement about how harsh the relation between what we do to the land and the land is. Yeah. I wasn't looking for that. I wasn't yeah. looking for anything. Mm -hmm. but what struck me about this was how gentle the relation was between the human industry and nature. It mm -hmm. seemed to all sit together as a sort of, like you said, you used the word pastoral earlier, yeah. kind of that feeling. Mm -hmm. And that struck me as being Kind of beautiful Pastoral, yeah, and interesting okay. and unique yeah. and specific and also it just had a again it was a chance to put it, put the camera in a certain place yeah. where it all kind of composed itself mm. it sort of all just laid itself out for the camera so we had you know lovely things like the little white pole in the right foreground that kind of echoes the white salt in, in the, the yeah across the Indian the Arts little, yeah the little patio or whatever it is with the chain link fence which 
makes a perfect little corner to the composition and right. all these lucky things that made the picture work and if they weren't mm -hmm. there I probably wouldn't have done it. I see, yeah. And the old prison is a little bit more brighter though in terms of uh, the, the, the light, light and all that. So can, can you come on, c comment on the old prison? Like what's, uh, uh, well, it was taken on, on a late, later in the afternoon in the summer, so it's of course very, very different atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. You know how Vancouver is beautiful in the summer. Yeah, the weather is great, the light is great. Yeah. It's one of the nicest places to be in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I discovered the scene in the summer and I knew that it was the time to do it. Although I guess I could imagine it in the snow. It could have been quite beautiful too. Yeah. But I didn't do it then. Um, yeah. And y y you know, the river is a great motif. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, whether it's in the literature, you know, many myths, original myths include the river. Yes. There's this kind of flow of time and life. And so also yeah. like operational yeah, legends and all that, yeah. So the river is... Same as Chinese, like the well zen, it's zen and all that. It's, it's global. Zen, yeah, it's I mean, global. There are, everybody relates to the river. Every culture relates to the river. Because yeah. most cu cultures emerged by rivers. Mm. So the river has played this role for thousands of years. Yeah. And so, uh, and the Fraser is, uh, you know, our river. Particularly I, important in for Vancouver, city of Vancouver. Is in, so yeah, well, it's, area, it's still yeah. important. I mean, most of the forest comes out of BC yeah. down the river, down That's the right. down the Fraser. Yeah. You can see thousands of logs sitting there, and, and any given day in the Fraser, you can yeah. see yeah. thousands of logs going to out to wherever they're going to the mills. Yeah. And uh, so, of course, I wanted to do the river. Okay. And I and I spent a lot of time and I uh, on the river. Yeah. Um, and I this is uh, above, <coughs> New, above New Westminster. That's right. Or it is in New Westminster, I guess. Yeah. And uh, the river just resolves itself into this beautiful curve that mm -hmm. is at that point. And it is one of the few points where you can see the curve of the river, the bend of the river, which is, yes. you know, just yeah. sh as a and shape. It's just especially with the floating logs, they kind of reinforce that curve even more dramatic. Isn't it? I'm yeah. glad there was that. If there weren't any logs that day, I might have waited around because um, yeah. the logs are quite important. It is. Yeah. They also tell you a lot about the place. It's mm. a logging world, you know. It's right. a forest, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think that was also very important. Part of part of a history as well. Yeah. yeah, and I mean curves and bridges. They're just inherently visually fascinating. So of course, yeah. when I when I got up to that height, yeah. that hill above the above the uh, water, I realized, yeah. oh, this is uh, the view of the Fra This is the That's this is the best view of the Fraser I that I'm ever going to see, and I've never gotten a better one. I agree, and, yeah. And I think it's, it was a beautiful spot yeah. and the people who live in the condos up there now yeah. that, that are on that site yeah. probably get to see that every day, lucky for them. Yeah. I couldn't make that picture today yeah. because and I'd be in I, someone's living room. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, like in terms of all this element to put in the composition for like landscape picture, uh, the, the, the old master will probably agree that they, they obviously using a lot of similar element, except this is post-industry, post right? Post-industrial. Well, yeah. No, I wouldn't say it's post-industrial. It was pretty industrial to me. <laughs> that's true. It's not post-logging. That's for sure. <laughs> that's true. We still logging. Yeah. But you see, yeah. also if you look at the at the further part of the river, except for the bridge, which yeah. I think is that uh, riverscape would have not have changed much between 1920 and 1987. Yeah. yeah. There's a few sawmills. It, you know, there's t settlement on the banks. Right. There's not much else going on. Yeah. Um, that's what I, uh, why mm. I said earlier that these pictures still have a connection to how Vancouver was. That's right. Yeah. In the decades before I took yeah. the pictures and how it it yeah. is and isn't. Except there's more residential towers and condos uh, along the river. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the no, prime no. prime real estate. Yeah. I think the south, the southern parts of Vancouver are going to become covered with towers. Yeah. In the next few decades, and maybe that'll be. Yeah. I mean, that'll be a new landscape. Mm. Um, and I'm looking at it already. Okay. But I'm not finding anything, as I said. Okay. So um, you see, there's a potential, but it's not quite there yet in terms of the cityscape for for this kind of new. Uh, the, next time I, the next time I go out looking, which I do when I have time. Yeah. So if I have a free afternoon or something, or on a weekend, I will just think, well, I better, I'd like to go and have a look around. Mm. And so I will pick an area, like yep. uh, a neighborhood. up the river or yep. wherever, and I'll go there for a little while yeah, yeah. and look. And uh, sometimes, mm. I s well, I haven't been lucky, as I said, but I might get lucky. 
So I'm, I'm still looking, and um, what I am looking at, of course, is the um, sudden spikes of mm. high building that are popping up all over the city. That's, of course, very, very new. Okay. And um, it is the phenomenon of the moment, yes. of the sudden yeah. in, in, you know, increase in um, height mm -hmm. that's being allowed. So something along those lines would be, would be obvious. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, but, but, but this picture really good in a way that the light box almost work as a window yeah, mm -hmm. for us looking to like 25, 30 years ago. And what I really like about it is there's almost like void of human presence. So when, when the visitor come to the gallery, they kind of almost act as, you know, this, this is home. And they're looking out the window and see all, see all this view. Yeah. I thought this, these would be good to show here because as we said in our uh, announcement for the show, haven't, people haven't seen these pictures for years yeah, yeah, in Vancouver. That's right, yeah. Maybe some of them have never been seen here in, t in public. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, especially the young, the young artists. Yeah, yeah or yeah. anyone. And, yeah. and so uh, it seemed like the right thing to show it is, here yeah. in town. Yeah. Um, and, it is, and, I, and despite the fact that, as I said, I haven't succeeded in doing any new ones, it's still an ongoing project. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, in terms of like the landscape genre, uh, you you were curious about within this genre then you might be have some other discovery when you're going through the process mm -hmm. and and you know and what what the landscape picture can conceal itself and then you can expand on them have you have you have you have you make any of those new discovery and which would you like to share um yeah, I, 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 the way I formulated it when I started thinking about it was that um, by standing back from a distance, yeah, at yeah. a distance and seeing into the world, yeah. you are actually f seeing hidden places that mm. contain other pictures, uh, and that it was a question of finding those places. Right, and right. that doing these pictures was also just a way for me to survey the world around me to figure out what I might do next on something in some other way. Okay, so. Um, and so I've always done that, and even if I didn't end up making a photo. So yeah. imagine, I could, ima I, could, I, I could easily imagine mm. going somewhere, some neighborhood, yeah. and by accident discovering a place. Right. Um, and in that yeah. place, something, it would occur to me that something might happen. Mm. And the something mm. that might happen would be something maybe I'd seen somewhere else. Mm. So often, as I, and I've said this many times, often I see things, but I don't photograph them. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not practicing that kind of photography where I carry a camera and I try to capture right. something as it occurs. Okay. I you you want it to be the process in your memory first, you know, kind of imprint it. I don't even yeah. know why I don't, I don't do it that way. I think that, uh, you know, there's uh, this process of documentary photography where yeah where people carry the camera and they search and hunt mm -hmm. and find things and once in, a, you know, one in a thousand they get a really good picture and that's so right, on. That's right, that's Like, uh, you know, Robert Frank or someone like that. Yep. Yep. I'm just not that kind of person. Mm -hmm. And so that struck me as not my, not the way that I would likely be very successful. Yeah. I just didn't really like it very much. You know, if you don't like something, you're probably not going to do that's it. Right, that's right, that's um, right. Whereas, I was still interested in these occurrences, whatever they might be, mm -hmm. but I wasn't interested in capturing them that way because it's, it seemed to restrict my ability to shape things. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I see things, I don't photograph them and I think, but nevertheless I can make them happen again. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I call what I do cinematography because mm -hmm. in the cinema people make things happen yeah. and they can look very real yeah. and we take them as real while we're watching a film. Yeah. So I can do that too and so um, I might find a, an event, an occurrence, mm. that I'd like to do something with, yeah. but the moment where I saw the occurrence, didn't, it didn't, the occurrence didn't take place in the right place for me. Mm. So then I need to find a place. Yeah. And yeah. it, you know, it's a process of letting the, finding those two, bringing those things together. Mm -hmm. So uh, quite a few of my pictures have been made that way, where I've started either, either with the place I liked, yeah. And then waited to, to see whether some mm. occurrence could be 
fit adapted in, there. Fit in there, yeah, yeah. Or started with an occurrence and then didn't like the place I saw it and then uh -huh. had to go to another one. Or some combination of the two. Yeah. And so that's happening, that happens pretty regularly. Yeah. But those places, I, I see them as, I've discovered most of them just by drifting around the city. Yes, okay. Uh, which is part of my work, just mm. drifting. Yeah. And um, I don't really search in the sense of, I don't quite know what I'm looking for, I'm just yeah. looking. Right. And if I see something, I'll make a note of it, and, and then I will re return to it when I can. So these, la these cityscapes, landscapes, I thought of as um, moments w during those searches where, mm. in fact, I didn't find a secluded spot, yeah. I found the overall thing. But uh, inside of that, I, you know, I would imagine yeah. that there are little secrets hidden that I could further Great. investigate. Yeah, I find it very interesting, like the secrets like within the picture while you're doing it, and then if the new discovery uh, reminds me of uh, a film called Blow Up. The you mean Antonioni's? Antonioni's Blow Up, yeah, where the, f the photograph accidentally filming the party and accidentally discovered is a murder, and mm -hmm. then you kind of get into more and more and discovery, so yeah. Yeah, it's a sort of a lurid and rather melodramatic version of what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah okay, that's good. Um, but it's uh, similar that, that yeah. you could certainly uh, go to one place and find something else. Yes, yeah. And that's happened to me many times. Okay, great. Uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the, keep, the, the keeping branches. Because um, when I study your work, I realize you, you actually have a whole um, collection of photographs about trees and logs and uh, it's true well the cuttings uh, the shape of the trees and uh, yeah uh, see I don't want uh, the sapling sitting on the pose and, and the creeping branches of course outside your studio uh, this one is a little bit different from the other three because they are super close up mm -hmm. right and so it, it plays a very interesting relationship uh, with, with the panoramic views and kind of a wide angle view to it although all of them all have trees. Um, yep, they do have trees, that's yeah. right. And this one evokes some sense of empathy because there was the, 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 the branches being clipped and, um, and especially situated in the downtown east side, which you also took a lot of photographs of the subjects around here. It's people who were struggling in the society, have a lot of suffering. Um, so, uh, from a lot of your work, it does evoke this sense, sense of empathy, and um, yeah, I, I wonder, yeah, where is that coming from? And how, how <laughs> well, I did feel empathy for those branches because the city crew came okay. and just sh sheared them off, you know, with <laughs> very little. Oh, now we know it's the city. Very little, it was uh, yeah. very little empathy. Yeah. They just got rid of the overgrowth. They don't and, care. Really. And, the, yeah. and I knew this. Uh, I know this tree because it's outside my studio. And I yeah. came out in the morning, or came by one, uh, came to the studio one day, and thought, "Oh, look at that! Yeah. Uh, they just <laughs> cut them off like that." And it seemed very unempathetic. But the little thing survived, of which course. is also very fascinating. The tree's still alive. Of course. Yeah. It's still there, in fact, yeah. and it's still the same bush is still there after. Yeah. I mean, how many years is that? Okay. But the, I, I mean, I don't claim to be empathetic because I think that's just a claim. Yeah. Um, mm. I think that the subjects I've made to deal with people's, other people's suffering mm -hmm. have been, I was inspired to do it. I, I, won't, I won't claim that I was inspired to do those pictures through any empathy mm. because I think that's something that one can only feel in the picture itself. Mm. Um, and I think me making any claims to caring about other people yeah, is yeah. maybe distracting in the sense that if the picture makes you feel that, then I will leave it there. Okay. But yeah. it's still important um, yeah. in the sense that I think that uh, um, having an affection for making images yeah. is a way of expressing having an affection for what is around us. Yeah, yeah. And I think all art really expresses that affection mm -hmm. in one way or the other. Yeah. And that no artist is really uh, exemplary in that regard. That anyone who wants to uh, preserve the appearance of the world yeah. somehow yeah. is yeah. expressing kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't th consider myself in any special 
condition there or any special relation there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the occurrence of the of the pruning of the tree yes. um, really was almost a comical example of Is that right? you know feeling sorry for something, oh, uh, okay. feeling sorry for something for that plant, mm. and kind of in a way almost um, you know characterizing the behavior of humans how they can mm. how they can be. Okay. But at the same time, there was no real cruelty involved in that act that because the crew was just doing what they were supposed to do and they weren't yeah, killing it. That's the they were job, just, yeah. It was overgrown and they just cut it back. Mm, they didn't mm. really you know, p pay too much attention. Right. But I really don't believe there was any cruelty involved. Mm, it was okay. just uh, the natural task yeah. of that pe those people yeah. who are maintaining civic order. I so see. in some ways they're doing a good thing. Yeah. Which is just sort of maintaining civic order. That's right. That's right. Um, and so I want to express that fact too, that it uh, that it it was sort of a there's sort of a symbiosis between the two because <laughs> the little plant is still there, the tree is still there, yeah. and nothing was killed in Nobody the process. Nobody got hurt. Yeah. And so there's sort of that whole complex of it, and I think that made the picture kind of interesting because yeah. you have to, if you you look at it, you realize there's a tree growing at some in some phase of its growth and yeah. the plant at another phase of its growth and they're kind of bonded together yeah. Yeah. and so those um, those little distinctions between mm. uh, condition okay. so this entity is in this condition and this entity is in this okay. condition yeah. for example if you look at the horrible scenes of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria right. it's remarkable that you see a building yeah. entirely collapsed yeah. and next door the building is still there mm. so the people who are in this living in this Survive, building, yeah. they're okay. Yeah, and and they're next door neighbor. They're all gone, the whole family is... It's all gone. Yeah, that's true. It's not that different from the two, I mean, it's not that different in principle from the two, uh, 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 the tree and the plant, yeah. one in one state, one in the other state. Yeah. And that adjacency of two different states yes. is inherently fascinating. Yeah. Like if you, see it, if you see two people who are in a relationship, often you wonder, what are they doing together? Mm. Because this one doesn't seem to go with this one. That, that kind of fascination yeah. of any bondings, whether it's people, trees, yeah. animals, yeah. buildings, yeah. you wonder why they yeah. ended up side by side. The, the people relationship, the romance and all that also shows a lot in your works as well, mostly in the interior settings. I that, I mean, that, that, that fascination is elemental and so every Every depiction of a thing beside another thing, or mm. a thing in relation to the other thing, creates a a, um, a, a speculation mm. uh, about that relationship, that's and I true. think that uh, something that uh, I think that's something that pictures can uniquely do mm. because they simultaneously present things, right. and so that's what we work with. Okay. Is that I, the 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 gum gum package? On the Kipping, is that a near documentary or it was there? All there. It's all there. So this is pure documentary. These are all yeah. pretty, these are all totally documentary photographs, including the the man in the red shirt. The man in the r red shirt <laughs> is the man in the red shirt. He's, okay, he's there. We don't have to get in there. Okay, you seem to also spend some time in LA uh, making works there. You have a studio there and a practice. Uh, so a last while where your early, a lot of early work is in, in Vancouver, right? Um, so, uh, so how do you distribute your time? Uh, uh -huh. uh, yeah. um, I don't really have a plan. Um, yeah. You know, in the end, at, at this point, I've made pictures in quite a lot of places, including Istanbul and Spain. I see, okay. And so on. I, I have made pictures in different parts of the world, yeah. but I don't pursue that because um, I don't know why I don't pursue it actually, I just don't pursue it, it seems mm. secondary. If I end up somewhere, I yeah. will go there. Yeah, if but, you see something interesting. But I'm not, so, yeah. I don't have the aim of touring the globe and, and finding something yeah. everywhere. It would take uh, a lot of energy, isn't it? It would take a lot of energy, yeah. but uh, I don't <coughs> feel it's terribly important to me, at mm. least. I mean, any place can represent uh, any place can stand for every place. That's true. Yeah. So um, yeah. Vancouver was when I, you know, when I started working intensely here, I realized that Vancouver was just as good as anywhere. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm sure there are places where there are more spectacular and interesting yeah. cityscapes. Yeah, yeah. But nevertheless, it was it was perfectly adequate. Mm -hmm. And I didn't uh, um, start working in California for any particular reason. 
Right. It was just sort of a drift of circumstances that took me there in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and I did a few pictures in the 90s there um, and liked it. Yeah. And then, you know, for personal reasons, my wife and I got a place in L.A. Mm -hmm. for just to have. Yeah. And then it allowed me to do some more work there. So I, yeah. I do work there when I kind of feel like it. Yeah. And also when something comes up. Mm -hmm. But you do prefer the weather there. I don't particularly no. pre pre prefer the weather there because okay. I was born in Vancouver and I'm used to the rain and I'm mm. used to the gray Cold. and I kind of like it. Okay. So um, I don't really just I don't really mind the climate here. I think it's quite wonderful and I photo try to and I've tried mm. to photograph in all kinds of weather here from you know dark rainy days to bright sunny days to everything yeah. in between because um, light is one of the fundamental things we use. Yes. Uh, so I. I would go anywhere tomorrow if it came up. I, it mm -hmm. just has to come up. Okay. Um, last question is, uh, what are you working on? Any new projects and uh, new exhibitions coming up? Because you seem like always have exhibitions. I have a big exhibition yeah. coming up yeah. next year in Switzerland uh, at the Beiler Foundation, which is a private collection, mm -hmm. but uh, very public. Okay. Um, and it's going to be one of the biggest survey shows I've done in many years, or fi over 50 pictures yep. uh, going right back to the 70s or 80s mm -hmm. up to now. Okay. So that's a show I'm doing. That's the next show I'm doing actually. Yeah, that's a lot of planning. Is that a lot of work? Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be quite involved in it. Yeah. And, um, and meanwhile I'm just working. I, I'm just working on new pictures okay. yeah. which I will try and exhibit partly there and maybe in New York next year. Okay. And uh, uh, just going on. I don't think I'm breaking any drastic new ground, but I mm. think that inside of the picture making enterprise, yes. it's very hard to do something drastically new yes. yeah. um, because a picture pictures are pictures and they remain so mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. long periods of time. Yeah. Um, but what I feel about innovation in that um, sense mm -hmm. is that because picture making enterprise or domain is so vast, yeah. that every picture is kind of new um, in its sense. And, there, and the next subject will be different from the previous, right. the next place will be different from the previous, and it will probably lead me to try and make some slightly, or at least, yeah, let's say at least slightly new thing. I try mm -hmm. not to repeat mm -hmm. myself. I try not to do something that essentially I've done before. Well, you, you've obviously managed really well in that regard. It's just one of the the best master we have in terms of using the medium of reinventing and reinventing itself. It's just really hard to see any new photo artist that has, you know, shadow has from you. So, yeah. You're very kind, Lam. Thank you. <laughs> okay, in that regard, um, yeah, that, that will be our talk today. Um, I hope this show gives you a bit of a pleasure between your big shows, kind of, yeah, in, 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 in between time. Uh, well, I love making a show. I, I like making small shows. Oh, great, okay. Because they can be very pointed and focused on a certain element. Yeah. And uh, of course, they're not too difficult to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, shows of between two and ten pictures can be really some of the most satisfying because they can be very nicely structured to yeah. you know, create a certain ambiance or a certain little dance of and also conversation between them and yeah. relationship. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm I'm really really happy that you you feel that way. I do. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeff, again uh, for your wisdom and sharing and all yeah all your artistic mind. Fascinating, really fascinating for for all thanks. of us. Thanks and for asking me to do it. I'm very glad you did. Okay. Well, hopefully we'll work together again. <laughs> no doubt. Okay. Hey, thank you. Okay.